back to it the more I just saw the ministry that was there to me personally and, and I think would be to, to you as well. I never want to preach anything that I don't think ministers to me too, amen? And uh, try to make that the first place that it hits home base right here, lest I be guilty of teaching and not being teachable, amen? Now when I looked at this, 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 this miracle of the Lord, certainly that song we just sang is, is so appropriate to, how, to see just how the Lord moves in this particular situation. It's one of these great miracles. Again, every miracle is a demonstration of the glory of God. We've talked about how that they were all a sign. That's what the word miracle literally translates. It was a sign of the deity of Christ, that here's God in the flesh, and that he's the Messiah. But again, beyond that, the practical lessons for our life that we can glean from that and how the Lord would speak to us from those things even where we are today. So if we look in, in chapter 13 of Luke, there's verses 10 through 16. We'll go to those verses, take a look, and see what the Lord says to us today. Hope you have ears to hear. He was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. Behold, there was a woman who for 18 years had, had a sickness caused by a spirit, and she was bent double and could not straighten up at all. And when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your sickness. And he laid his hands upon her, and immediately she was made erect again and began glorifying God. And the synagogue official, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, began saying to the multitude in response, there are six days in which work should be done. Therefore, come during them and get healed, not on the Sabbath day. But the Lord answered him and said, You hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the stall and lead him away to water him? And this woman, daughter of Abraham, as she is, whom Satan has bound for 18 long years, should she not have been released from this bond on the Sabbath day? As he said this, all his opponents were being humiliated, and the entire multitude was rejoicing over all the glorious things be, being done by him. Now again, as we get into the last of these miracles, as we talked about last week, the healing of blind Bartimaeus, in each one of these is a very real historical value. Or the, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lesson that the Lord is teaching, and he's, he's come, remember, first and foremost for the nation of Israel. So all these have a great application in, in regard to the historical value and relationship to Israel as a nation and the prophecies fulfilling the Lord Jesus Christ coming for the nation of Israel. And then there's the practical value, which we'll glean from for ourselves. But from the historical sense, I mean, it was Jesus' mission first and foremost to the nation of Israel. And we see the response of this synagogue leader, which kind of gives us an insight to their, their general attitudes towards Jesus. You know, they, they, they're arrogant, they're hypocritical, they're proud. And the Lord's standing there in the midst of Israel and the nation, wanting to do a deep work in their lives, wanting to present himself as their Messiah and their hope, and they rejecting him. And the political leaders were rejecting him, the religious leaders, as we see many of the people at this point in time had begun to turn away from him as well. So it was Jesus' mission to come, loose the nation of Israel, get them back in a proper, upright, righteous relationship with their Father in heaven, but they rejected him. And this, is this a graphic example of the Lord coming, touching these people like he touched this woman, bringing her to a position to stand upright and be able to stand freely? That's what God's intent was for the nation of Israel. Jesus touched her. Jesus healed by his words. But the nation of Israel didn't receive it themselves. And then I want to look at a practical value today and, and talk about where she was and even how... That relates to us today and maybe even to you personally if you have ears to hear what's being said. If you know two things about a condition, you're going to have to do the down buttons for me there, all right? It's, it's, uh, it's not giving me the down. It goes back to, uh, to spiritually, where it talks about physically and spiritually. Boom, boom. Two bumps down if, it, if it'll give them to you. Just not working? Well, we'll just preach it without that, all right? There you go. Physically, she's crippled. Understand, for 18 years, she's been this way. It's, it's not something that's it's kind of come and gone. This is a malady she's had to live with for a long, long, long time. Spiritually, she's also crippled. In fact, the Bible says her physical crippling was caused by a demonic spirit. She was crippled by a demon spirit of infirmity. And the Lord deals with that, and he, and he makes it clear in verse 16 that she, she's been bound by a spirit and bound by Satan all these years. First of all, when you look at the aspect of her being crippled physically, just, this woman has a spirit of infirmity, and it's been for 18 years. And the, the picture kind of shows you what that infirmity or what that disease would do. It's kind of difficult to translate this disease into the English terminology uh, that, that Luke, who, by the way, was a physician, uses to describe her condition. But she's bent over. In fact, the, the word there in the New American Standard through Weymouth translation, it says that she was bent double. 
She couldn't lift herself up. She couldn't raise herself up from that position. Eight. 18 years looking down, 18 years not being able to have a normal relationship with people, 18 years crippled. She's the daughter of Abraham, but yet she's crippled. Now this is, a, a, again, a good illustration for us today. Being a daughter of Abraham, a child of God, you know, we think about our lives as the children of God, as Christians, we've come to know Christ. But there's a lot of Christians who've come to know Christ who really aren't experiencing the freedom that's in Christ. They're bent over. They're, they're, they're crippled. They're, they're not what God wants them to be. They, they need to be, but it's like this. They're, they're saved, but they're in captivity. They're, they're in bondage. And where the Lord said, I want freedom to be in your life, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. They're not experiencing the full freedom that belongs to them in the Lord Jesus Christ. She comes to the synagogue on this day. Jesus is there, and he restores her health. And by the way, this is a good reason not to miss church. You never know when Jesus is going to show up in power, amen, and do something supernatural, perhaps maybe that you've been needing. But she's there and she's faithfully attends. She's a faithful follower of the Lord. Yes, she's, can you imagine the kind of isolation and the kind of life that she's had to live in this regard? Some of you may not remember Thomas Sutherland. I guess it's probably been a decade now that uh, he was captured by Shiite Muslims in the Middle East and held captive uh, for about four years, I guess, uh, or maybe a little bit more. And of all that time that he was held captive, Sutherland was spent most of that time in solitary confinement. He gave a speech after his captivity uh, where he asked this unforgettable question. He said, uh, do you know what it's like to be in prison? Do you know what it's like to be held hostage, to be a captive? It's very lonely and you worry that people will forget you. I felt abandoned. I didn't think anybody even knew that I was in prison. In fact, in that speech, he, he went on to describe how during that imprisonment that he could hear uh, some, some of the men who held him in captivity listening to the BBC, British Broadcasting Network, every day and said he would try to listen carefully to see if his name might be mentioned at all, that, you know, that the world was missing him. Or that, but he said no, for four years he never heard his name on any broadcast or any newscast. He kind of felt that maybe nobody even knows I'm here. Perhaps somebody, most people maybe just think I'm dead that do know me and love me. But my name never mentioned, he said, it just made me feel that, you know, nobody even knew I was being held hostage. But after four years, he was released and our government uh, flew his wife, Jean, and flew him to an area where they could be re reunited and have a family reunion. And they were excited to see each other. After being there for some time, they flew back home to the United States together. As they were flying into San Francisco airport, uh, Taxing there, Tom looked out the window and saw that there was a great number of TV reporters and newscasters and lights and a large crowd of people that are gathered there and turned to his wife and said, you know, there must be a celebrity on the plane. She said, what do you mean, Tom? They're here for you. He said, what? She said, yeah, this is all for you. He said, when my wife told me that, he said, I started crying. He said, I, I couldn't stop crying. He said, I was sobbing like a little baby boy. I just couldn't believe it. I said, I thought everybody had forgotten me. I didn't think anybody knew I was in captivity. I felt completely abandoned. I didn't think anybody cared. Thank God I was wrong. Four years is a long time. 18 years for this woman was a lot longer to be held in captivity. 18 years, maybe she felt like she's forgotten. 18 years, she's been faithful. She goes to the synagogue. Maybe she even feels like God's forgotten her. I'm sure she wished every day that somehow she could stand up straight and look people in the eye, but realize that nothing could be done for her. So she was crippled physically. But when we read the scripture look carefully, we see that her being crippled physically was because she was crippled spiritually. Jesus said, by spirit and bondage to Satan all these years that a spirit had crippled her. For the child of God... If we're Christians, when you study what it says about demons and demon spirits and their ministry, we know in opposing our Christian life, you know, you understand there's a couple things about demons. One, they cannot go where they want or where they're not invited, and they cannot go where they are not sent. All right? They can't go where they're not invited, and they can't go where they're not sent. In 1 John 5, it says this. I think it says this. It says, we're of God, little children, and the wicked one cannot touch us. In other words, if we're Christians, we're under this great grace, uh, this umbrella of grace, this great protection by the blood and by the word, by the name of Jesus. You know, so Satan can't get to us. But remember what I said, they can't go where they're not invited, all right? And they can't go where they're not sent. What happens is we as Christians can rebel against God. We as Christians can form our own mindset of how we want to live our lives. We can ignore what God says and 
embrace what we want to believe and think the way we want to believe and even just rebel against God. And when we do that, we open the door for some type of demonic infiltration. Now, I know there's a lot of Christians who don't believe that. But I want you to think with me for just a moment. When you look at all those things in the New Testament that talk about the ministry of demons and warfare, you remember who they're written to. They're not written to lost people, are they? They're written to Christians. Who is it that's supposed to put on the whole armor of God? The Christians are, right? We as believers are. Who is it to be sober-minded and to guard their mind? It's Christians. Who is it that receives a warning to be careful? Your adversary walks about like a roaring lion seeking someone whom he may devour. And he gets the opportunity to devour, to destroy, to work against us when we start moving out from under that protective grace umbrella of ours and get out into a place of rebellion. The Bible says rebellion is like the sin of witchcraft. Well, we obviously know that witchcraft operates within the domain of spiritual darkness. Amen? Well, there's a lot of demonic activity. And God likens our disobedience and our rebellion to that same kind of thing. Now, it may not be some kind of violent rebellion you're thinking of in your heart, but what happens is you open the door in some regard in your life, and you start ignoring what the Lord says. In fact, Paul talks about strongholds. Remember he said, pull down the strongholds that are in your mind? And he tells us how to do it by taking every thought into captivity. Now, how does that pull down the strongholds? Well, it makes it very clear, as many other places in Scripture do, that the real battle against Satan takes place where? In our mind. That's where the thoughts come. That's where we're allured. That's where we're tempted. That's where we're pulled at. He comes, and on the battlefield of our mind, he begins to wage a war. And what he wants to do is to get you as a Christian to establish uh, a way of living, a philosophy, if you want to call that, about life or about issues or things that's contrary to God's way and God's idea and God's way of thinking. And Paul put it like this. It's the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. Unfortunately... We as Christians have a real easy tendency to embrace the wisdom of the world instead of the wisdom of God. Remember the wisdom of the world is foolishness, all right? And we act foolish at times. And we have excuses for acting foolish. And we embrace a particular way of thinking. And when we embrace a particular way of thinking that's contrary to what the Bible says, then strongholds are being built up. And a stronghold is a fortified place where the enemy can inhabit. Are you right with me still? Now, Satan, I do not believe, can inhabit your spirit. All right? But certainly our mind becomes an open target, and he affects our emotions, and he affects our will from there. So we understand that, hey, if we are disobedient to God, then certainly it's like opening the door for the devil and wanting to dance with demons. That becomes a dangerous thing. And sometimes, well, here's the way it works in our life. We're walking through our Christian life and seeking to follow the, follow the Lord Jesus until we're confronted with something a decision, perhaps, that we need to make a choice. And should we choose wrong, we're out of the will of God. Should we choose right, we're in the will of God. It could be even something like an attitude. We, we're, we're, we're called by God to embrace a certain attitude towards something or some sin or some situation, and we just don't do it. We, we use excuses. Well, I know what the Bible says, but... You ever find yourself, I know what the Bible says, but that's just not me. I, I know what the Bible, but that's not the way I was raised. I know what the Bible says, but a real man's going to bust him in the mouth. Are you with me still? I know what the Bible says, but you don't know what they did to me. I know what the Bible says, but... And we go through this, this, this litany of buts in our life, and we just miss God completely. And what's happening is we, ha we have this little idea that we said, I'd rather believe this. this. It's like this little stronghold. I'd rather embrace this than to believe what the Bible says here. It could be even something you've been taught all your lives. Kind of taking it for the gospel truth, you know. But the problem is, if it doesn't square with Scripture, then it's not right. It's not true. Truth always leads to freedom. Deception, darkness, sin always lead to bondage. So when the lights come on and the Lord speaks to you about things in your heart and your life, and He will do that, that's part of His ministry, the best thing we can do is adjust ourselves to the light. I remember walking into a restaurant one night. It was a bright, sunny day outside. And you walked into it, it was black as night in the restaurant. And I'm trying to fumble around to where the steps are. And the waitress says something like this. Oh, don't worry. It's dark in here, but you'll get used to it. And unfortunately, we would rather adjust to the darkness than adjust to the light. Sometimes it's bright, but we just need to keep moving towards Jesus. 
Sometimes it may seem glaring and maybe <laughs> be offensive or hurtful to us, but we still need to keep moving towards the light and trust in the Lord. Otherwise, the door is open and we're inviting our enemy to come in. Now, on the other hand, we said the devil cannot go where he is not invited or where he is not sent. Sometimes we don't understand this, but God will use the devil to carry out his work and his will. Manly Beasley used to make the statement, the devil's really just God's messenger boy. If we truly understand the sovereignty of God, you know, some of y'all think that the devil and, and Jesus are kind of in a boxing match, you know, and hopefully by the, by the 10th round or whatever that the Lord will win. No, the Lord's already won. Yeah, there was no fight. It was just, it just Jesus conquered him, all right? And he overcame him. And the only reason that he is left loose now, he will be bound up one day for eternity. The only reason he is left loose now is to accomplish God's word and accomplish God's will. That's the way it works, folks. You say, well, I just don't understand that. I don't get that theology. I don't get that. Hey, understand the Bible's true whether we always get it or not. And there are several in, in, uh, places and instances in Scripture where you see where the enemy might be s sent to accomplish the will of God in some regard. In fact, there's a lot of instances. One of the most obvious I think we could look at would be over in uh, 2 Corinthians where Paul was talking about his thorn in the flesh. He said, you know, I had this thorn in the flesh. Remember what it started out with? It was this great vision. Man was caught in the heavens, you know. Saw two things too wonderful to speak. He went on about how great that revelation was. And then he used these verses. Then, then God sent me this messenger, Satan, to buffet me. Uh, it was my thorn in the flesh, lest I should be exalted above measure. In other, words, in other words, the Lord let the enemy come, you know, and, and, and bring this messenger of the enemy, this demon, which he called a thorn in his flesh. Literally, it used the words to, to buffet me. He buffeted me, lest I become too proud. In other words, God allowed something in his life to keep him humble. And the means by which he did it in this situation was a particular spirit, a messenger of the enemy. Again, you look at Job chapter 1. You want to see the sovereignty of God? In Job chapter 1, you see the great story there where God's in, 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 in communication and the devil's speaking, God's speaking. God says, have you considered my servant Job? And he allowed the devil to, to go do things unto Job but not take his life. Ultimately, it was for Job's good. Ultimately, for Job's advantage. In fact, Job said at the end of it all, he said, you know, he said just... He said, I, you know, I understand God more fully than I ever have now. He said, I've, I've heard of you all my life, but now I understand. Now I see. Had it not been for that occasion in his life, he'd never had the walk with God that God intended for him. I've said it many times. No one's done more for me in my walk with Christ other than the Holy Spirit. Nobody's done more other than him than the devil. Because when he comes, if we are, if we are paying attention, we'll always run to Christ. And even if he succeeds on some level in my life, it's going to run me back to Jesus anyway. I don't want to live in disobedience. I don't want to live in, 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 in a partial commitment to Christ. And so when Satan comes and comes in like a flood, God raises his standards. Man, we run back to Jesus. And even in our failures, we run back to Jesus. We're stronger than we were before. If we allow God to work in our lives. So you see Paul and you see Job. And these are just some instances how the, the Lord would allow the enemy. So... <clears throat> This is the way that, that, that Satan works, but again, he works within the confines of the sovereignty of God. And we need to understand that. And we understand that by understanding then again just how good God is to us. Unfortunately, as I read this passage and began to think about preaching this in this particular series, God kept bringing me back to this. There are a lot of Christians, and there's a lot of people in our own church who, like the daughter of Abraham, love the Lord, but somehow by allowing something in their life to coexist in their walk with God. These strongholds have been built up and they're crippled by it. They're not where God wants them to be. They're limited in their ability to function in their spiritual life. They're saved, love God, but held in captivity and held in bondage. I believe there's four ways by which, by which the enemy can afflict us in this regard and where Satan can cripple our lives. And if you... If you have any interest in deepening your walk with God, I encourage you to open your heart so totally to the Holy Spirit right now that He might speak to you. Because if any of these things are in your life, that you would resolve to be like this woman who listened to the Word of God and who received the touch of God on her life. Because I believe God's here to do something in your heart and your life today. 
I don't believe we're just meeting here casually. I believe the presence of God is in our midst. We have the promise of Scripture on that. Beyond what we can sense with our emotions, we have the promise of God that He's present in this room right now. I think the first way that many Christians are crippled, and the way Satan cripples us this, is a wounded spirit. Proverbs 18, 14 says, A spirit of man will sustain his infirmity, but a wounded spirit who can bear? A wounded spirit. Now, I believe we get hurt in three basic ways. Go ahead and bring those up. Abuses, betrayals, and rejections. I think those are the three ways which we get a wounded spirit more than any other way. Now, we're not talking about a broken spirit. The Bible talks about brokenness being good for us. Brokenness brings us to the end of ourselves. Brokenness brings us to Christ. The Bible says God loves a broken heart, you know, our broken spirit. But we're talking about something different. There's a difference between being broken and being wounded. And there's a lot of people today who are wounded. They've been hurt, but somebody's abused them. Somebody they loved betrayed them. They, they, that betrayal hurt them deeply. Somebody rejected you. Now, if you are part of the human species, which I think most of you are, then all of these happen to us in life. As parents, we're shielding our kids through this and walking them through this. They're still going to experience these things. Unfortunately, when the wounds come so many times, most people don't know how to deal with it. And they are affected by it or infected by it most of their lives. And what a tragedy. It holds them in bondage and it holds them in captivity. I could ask for a raising of hands and probably if I mentioned all three and asked you to raise, everybody would raise their hand on one or two, if not all three of these, saying, yeah, I, I've been there. People hurt us. We get hurt by deeds of others. We get hurt by betrayals of others. We get hurt by words of others. <laughs> I mean, they tell us, you'll just never amount to anything. You're stupid. You're ugly. It could be parents. It could be friends. It could be absolute strangers. And it cuts could be somebody we loved and somebody they, that we trusted. And out of their own ignorance, they said something or did something. And what happens? We become wounded. We get bent over. And the more we reject or refuse to deal with this according to the wisdom of God, which God gives us a word on how to deal with, with these things in our life. If we don't respond to that, we get more bent over and we become more angry and we become even more bitter. And the more that we do that, the more that Satan has advantage in our life and the more that he cripples our life. We get to the place we just can't look up anymore and we just can't look to see Jesus. That's a wounded spirit. The second one is this, a legalistic spirit. If you see the Pharisees, this was their problem. In, in verse, uh, chapter 13, verse 14, remember he gets up and he speaks to the whole crowd. Says, hey, you know, hey, if you want to get healed, don't come on the Sabbath, come any other day. This is Sabbath. Who, getting healed on the Sabbath, that's ungodly. And remember, Jesus rebuked him because he had more sympathy for his animals than he did this precious lady. He couldn't see that message that we just sang about, oh, how he loves us, he loves us, he loves us. No, all he saw is we got some rules we got to go by. And the Pharisee, you know, he, he looks on this situation. He's all indignant because Jesus had to follow the law as the Pharisee interpreted the law. So he appeals to the crowd to reject this miracle of Jesus. Jesus making it very clear, hey, it's more important to love people than to love our... our if we're... <laughs> We feel sorry for our animals because we see them thirsty, so we, on the Sabbath, go loose them and water them. How much more so should we have compassion on a woman who's been over and suffering? I mean, the, the hypocrisy and the foolishness of the whole thing of these religious leaders was so obvious, and Jesus is rebuking them for it, and that's why they didn't like him. They were humiliated by it. And sometimes it's so easy to fall in that little legalistic mindset of our own. Well, look at them. Look how ungodly they are. And we, we kind of measure them by ourselves. They do what I don't do. They're, so they're, therefore, they're ungodly. And even Christians, it's so easy to watch Christians fall in this judgmental, critical attitude and just kind of measure everything and judge everything. I mean, that's the culture we live in, though, isn't it? Everything's measured and standard and judged. I and mean, we've got the American Idol and the voice and all these other things. And, and everybody's sitting around and making judgments, you know. And, and they come to church that way. Christians come to church and they look at what everybody else is wearing or what everybody else is saying or how they can sing or not sing, miss a note, hit a note, whatever it might be, mess a point on the sermon, get the scripture backwards or whatever it might be. And, and, and it's a little judgment. Well, did, you, well, did you see that? Did you hear that? And we hold, uh, hold these people up to these high standards. And many times when we're not even willing to respond to them, those same standards with our own lives. Look at those gossips. And we're just sitting there gossiping. It's legalism. 
How, how did Jesus respond? He said, let me tell you what the most important thing is. He said, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, with all your mind. That's the first and the greatest commandment. And by the way, the second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All that the law says, all that the prophet said, hang on these two commandments. And we lose the spirit of love and reaching out and caring and having a burden and praying, ministering, wanting to help people. We become like the Pharisees saying what ought to be done, not be done. Instead of reaching out and love to heal somebody, we've missed the mark. But it's all part of that thing where there's an area of captivity in our spiritual life, and we miss it. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is what? It's love, it's joy, it's peace, it's patience. Patience, it's patience, it's kindness, it's kindness, it's kindness, it's goodness, it's goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. That's what the Spirit produces in our life. Not arrogance, not critical spirit, not backbiting, not jealousy, and envy, and Anger. We get brought, in, brought into a place of bondage and captivity in our spiritual life. Third thing is an unforgiving spirit, which kind of goes with that, with that first one in some ways by being a wounded spirit. We just have this unforgiving spirit. How many times have you ever heard this statement? Oh, they just make me sick. Most of them this means, oh, I'm so unwilling to forgive them. Oh, when I get around brother so-and-so, I just get a headache. Which means when I get around brother so-and-so, it reminds me I haven't forgiven him. When I saw the abuse, when I saw the offense, it means I haven't forgiven him. That is a spirit that can really cripple us and keep us from being godly and godlike in our lives. Studies have shown that people who carry grudges, admitted or not, have significantly reduced lifespans and a greater increase for diseases. A woman's physically bent over. 18 years. No spoken language can completely express her thoughts, her feelings. And sometimes, folks, when we get into a situation where we're just not willing to forgive because of the abuses, perhaps, because of the neglect, because of the rejection, whatever it might be, we end up being crippled in the same kind of way. And, and you hear stuff, and again, this, this proves you have a, a, an area of captivity in your life. And you say, well, that's just not the way I do it. Or that's just not the way I was raised. Or that's just not how I handle it. What are you saying? You're saying, I reject the word of God, and I choose the foolishness of the world. I reject the way God tells me to handle this, and I'm going to handle this the way I want to handle it. Again, an evident sign of bondage. An unforgiving spirit. Jesus said, You've been forgiven, so forgive others. As your Father in heaven has forgiven you, then you forgive one another. Jesus forgave us when nobody was asking for it. While the nails are being driven through his flesh, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. And folks, that hurt. And sometimes we don't realize for us to say, I forgive, it hurts us as well. But it's, it is far better to take the abuse and to take the hurt and to release it than to let it take you into bondage, into captivity. Exactly. The fourth, what I'll call a proud spirit. In fact, this is the most spirit, dam, damaging spirit in this world. It's, it's the one we're born with. We describe it as the old man, enmity with God. It's the spirit that puts self first on the throne and says, you know, I'm going to be in charge of my own life. Just the flesh. And we'll either let, live a life in the flesh, the scripture tells us, or we'll live a life in the spirit. The Bible says now you're of the spirit. If you choose to live after the flesh, you're just going to reap corruption. The flesh is not where you want to live as a believer. We are called as believers not to live in this and by this nature anymore. We've been given a new life and a new nature in Christ. The Bible says you put off the old man and you put on the new man. And when I say proud, I don't necessarily mean you walk around with an arrogant, you know, uh, huffy attitude towards people. It really just means no matter what the face is expressing or the body is expressing, you're in charge of your own life. And that's a miserable way to live your life. And Satan loves that because that's when he can get his little tentacles into you and when he can do the most damage. Paul talked about this in Romans. You know, in 5 and 6, he talks about the new life in Christ, but in chapter 7, he talks about the struggle. He said, what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. If I do not what I want to do, I agree with the law that the law is good, and it's no longer myself who do it, but it's sin living in me. I know that nothing good lives in me, that in my sinful nature, I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. Now, some people say, well, that's just the Christian life. No, you've got to read the whole letter. He's saying that's the struggle we're faced with once we come to Christ. 
doing what's right. We have this new desire to do what's right. But we find it so easy to do what's wrong because of our old nature. And then he goes to Romans 8 and he says, hey, live your life in Christ. Live your life in the Spirit. Live your life in the law of the Spirit and life in Christ Jesus. You don't live in your old man. It means when I get up in the morning, I just say, Joe Arms is dead indeed unto sin, and now I'm alive unto God. I have Christ living in me. And I choose to trust him for his grace and for his strength and for his power. I'm not going to say, hey, I'm just going to live this. I live for you, Jesus. Just watch what I can do for you. I can't. I'll, I'll fall on my face. I won't succeed. I'll be an absolute failure in that attempt. Romans 8 says, therefore, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. In other words, I'm not bound by the law of sin and death anymore. I have Jesus in my life. I can do what God wants me to do now, because he lives in me to empower me to do it. And it's a matter of, will I trust him today? Isn't that really good? Will Will I just trust him today? Will I believe him? Will I follow him? And if I choose to to believe and to follow, I'm going to be frustrated. And I'm going to be held in captivity. Her deliverance, as well as our deliverance, was accomplished by two things here, folks. <coughs> One is the word of Jesus, and two is the touch of Jesus. The spirits that seek to cripple our lives are like a disease that needs to be healed. Like many of the other miracles we looked at, she didn't appeal to Jesus. She just went to church, synagogue, and Jesus saw her, and she got to experience that, oh, how he loves me. He called her out. <coughs> Excuse me. He called her forward, and he says he spoke to her, and then he touched her. You know, Jesus deals with us the same way. He speaks to us, and if we respond to what he says, you know what he does? He touches our lives. Every day, for every Sabbath day, but probably for 18 years, she's been faithful to the synagogue. She comes, she worships the Lord, goes home, still bent over. <coughs> you know, if you can get a little bit of the picture of what it really means, just in this simple step, in this simple process, quit trying to make things so difficult, you can, you can be free as well. You know, there, there are certain kind of buzzards that uh, they have to run about six or eight feet to take off. So if you take a buzzard, this this particular type of buzzard, and you put him in a pen that's about six feet long, a few feet wide, not very tall, he'll live in that that pen the rest of his life. He's an absolute prisoner to it because he doesn't quite have enough steps to take off and to to capture flight. So he'll, he'll remain a prisoner in that little, even though he can fly, he'll remain a prisoner there. The ordinary bat comes out, flies around at night. It's a remarkable creature in the air, you know. But this, the ordinary bat can't take off from a level place. How many of you have just seen a bat on the ground flopping around, flopping around? You know, and what they have to do, they have to flop so much, if they survive it, they can flop enough to get, enough to get it jumped into the air so they can take off. But they can't just take off from a level place until it reaches some slight elevation that can try and throw itself in the air. Then if it does, then it can take off in a flash. One more illustration. A bumblebee. If you drop a bumblebee into an open tumbler, it'll probably stay there until it dies, unless it's taken out. Because a bumblebee never seems to go up to find the means of escape. It'll always look to the outside or down and persist in trying to find some way out near the bottom or the sides. And if it doesn't find it, it just completely destroys itself. We can be like the buzzards and the bats and the bumblebees in a lot of ways. Struggling about all our problems, our frustrations, not realizing that what we need to do is to look up. Simply look up. And in looking up to the Lord, you can find the answer. And looking up to the Lord and listening to the Lord, you'll hear the word that says, Thou art loosed. Why? Because Jesus has already paid the price. You don't have to live in captivity. Thou art loosed. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed, the Scripture says. You shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Set you free. 
True freedom and liberty are found in Jesus Christ. Paul would just say, don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. It is for freedom that Christ has set you free. I want to be free. How can I be free? Look up. Listen. His word, the gospel, has been given, and it is a word of freedom. It's a word to be received. It's a word to be believed. You can take off. You can fly in Christ. You can be what God's called you to be. That's the grace of God. And so easy to miss in the world that we're living in today. And so many church members live in such bondage and such captivity when they don't have to. How about you today? You still in bondage to that wounded spirit? That unforgiving spirit? That legalistic spirit? Your flesh, your pride? Let go. Look up. The word's already been spoken. Receive what God had said you can receive, and you'll find out by faith. Listen, God will do the work. She didn't heal herself. When he said, thou art loosed, it means she could stand up. Can you imagine that moment of being able to stand up and look at the sky? Stand up and look at people in the face? Look them eye to eye? Especially being able to stand up and look in the face of Christ. There's a lot of folks still so bound up they can't look people in the eye. They got people in their life they can't look in the eye. They have family members they can't look in the eye. They got loved ones and relationships and people they work with they can't look in the eye. Thou art loosed. Thou art loosed. Won't you walk in the freedom that God's paid for you to have? Would you stand with your heads bowed today?